Coming up next on North Carolina Now, a special My Home NC edition. We pay a royal visit to the king, NASCAR Hall of Famer Richard Petty. We sit down and talk about racing history, legacy, and his North Carolina home. That's all coming up next. North Carolina Now is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC TV. Funding for My Home NC is provided in part by the Tom Howe Fund for UNC TV. Welcome to North Carolina Now for this special My Home NC edition. I'm Heather Burgess. We're in Level Cross at the Petty Museum, Home Place, and Historic Petty Garage for a very special conversation with the King, Richard Petty. With 200 wins and seven championships, you won't find anyone who is more accomplished in NASCAR than the King. Richard Petty sits down with us to talk about his career, his family, and why there is no place like his North Carolina home. We grew up with a car in the backyard instead of a barn, as far as, you know, being a farmer. So basically that's all I knew. And we are joined by the legendary Richard Petty. Thank you so much for being with us for yes, My Home and Sea. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Recently, Governor Pat McCrory uh, set aside a day, Richard Petty Day, March 31st. Given your North Carolina roots, and your, this is your home. Tell, describe what that felt like. Tell me a well, little bit about that. It's really a great honor. I mean, all the people that's ever been in North Carolina, uh, you know, we just happen to go out a lot. Uh, we go all over the country, all over the world. And uh, I, I don't think I go anywhere that don't ask where you're from. So you always say North Carolina. And uh, we're very, very proud of that. And, uh, you know, I think it gives a little bit of attention back to North Carolina. When you, we think we're here right in Level Cross, where you grew up. Next door is the house you were born in. Talk a little bit about growing up in Level Cross. What was that like? <laughs> well, I guess it was just common deal at the time. Uh, you know, we lived on a dirt road, didn't have any electricity, and naturally didn't have running water. Uh, and but the guys down the street didn't have it either, so it didn't make a whole lot of difference. And we really got uh, when Daddy started racing, then we went out and seen that they had hard roads and indoor plumbing and all that stuff, but, uh, you know, it was the deal. We grew up in that society and didn't know any difference, so we was happy as June bugs. We thought the whole world was like that, so we didn't really expand on not having anything. And uh, so, uh, you know, over a period of time, we were able to, to go out and see the real world and, and bring part of it back home. What was it like watching your dad, those early years watching him race and build cars? What was that like as a young, a young guy? Well, you know, all the people that I went to school with, all that, uh, a lot of them were farmers. Uh, they're in the dairy business. I'd come on and work on a race car. So I was a little bit different than the rest of the crowd. When did you know that you wanted to make racing your, your life's work? Basically, that's all I knew. And, and I, I don't know that I ever thought about doing it. I just never thought about doing anything else. And, uh, you know, as time progressed, my father was able to win races. And, and championships and then when I got old enough and at that time I was working on the race car and never really thought that much about driving until I, I think I was probably 18 years old or something when I asked my dad you know why can't I start driving he said come back when you're 21 we'll talk about it so uh, that, that's the way it happened. You had so many memorable races do you have a favorite race or a favorite memory? You know it, it's hard to say we ran over 1100 races and lost a bunch and won a bunch probably the 200th one was the biggest uh, hullabaloo around him. President of the United States was at Daytona uh, on July the 4th, and we won our 200th race, and we won it on the last green flag lap. So, you know, if you're just doing a script, you wouldn't have rooted out quite that way because kind of an unbelievable situation. Cars might be like children too, but do you have a favorite car? You know, everybody says sometimes <laughs> they're all your favorites. I told them any of them I could win in was favorites at that time. and. Uh, you know, we've got, I think, five of the, or six of the Daytona 500 winners won seven times. So th those are real big memories because that was the biggest race of the year, got us off to a good start, and most of the time we had good years when that happened. So uh, 
I guess they would have to be about as favorite a car as you had. The deal with Daytona, when it first started, Darlington was our biggest race. But after two or three years, Daytona got to be the biggest race because we're all, there's no racing in the United States for like three months. And everybody comes to Daytona, they've got new cars, new sponsors, new drivers, everything's brand new. Instead of having Super Bowl at the end of the year, we have our Super Bowl at the beginning of the year. And one thing about Daytona, which we was fortunate to win a bunch of times, is that you win Daytona and you're a winner all year long. In other words, everywhere you go, they introduce you as the Daytona champion. And uh, so the, of all the things, I guess, or any one track, Daytona was a big boost in Richard Petty's career because he was lucky enough to win some races. And again, it made me a winner all, all, didn't have to win another race all year long and you're still a winner. You are statistically the most accomplished driver in NASCAR history. What did you do to kind of tweak and get better each race? What, what kind of things did you do? <laughs> you know, I guess when we was going along and doing all this, you never thought about records or, or any of that kind of stuff. You just said, okay, we've got to do better this coming week than we've done this past week. Or if we won, we've got to go back and win it again. Because everything that, you know, that happened yesterday is history. So we had to re reinvent ourselves and reinvent everything every race, every season. And uh, I think that's what kept us going, kept us ahead of things. You had some memorable, cra memorable crashes, uh, the ones I know you want to forget. Uh, how, do you, how do you get back in a race car after going through something like that? You know, I've had a How did Linda everything. let you get back in a you race know, car? <laughs> You know, concussions, they broke my neck a couple times, broke all the ribs, broke legs, feet. And the first thing I'd ask the doctor when he come in, when can I get back in the race car? And he'd tell me three or four weeks. I said, okay, by Sunday I'll be okay. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the situation's a little bit different now. But I think NASCAR, everybody's more on the safety deal. Uh, I remember a bunch of races that NASCAR wouldn't have been let me in the racetrack in now. But then they just said, you know, whatever. And you got to figure, we were doing it for a living. We didn't have sponsors and stuff like that. So we didn't show up at a race and do good, then made it a little bit tougher to get to the next race. So it was, you did it because you had to, but the main deal is you wanted to do. I think about Linda. What, what, how did she feel when you would go out there and race every, every <laughs> week? You know, but she had mixed emotions, I know, uh, from the standpoint that, uh, her favorite deal was, you know, are we having fun? You know what I mean, doing it. I mean, I'd get hurt and she'd come in looking, be laying there on a stretcher or something. She said, are we having fun? And I said, <laughs> well, not right in a minute. Give me about 15 minutes and I'll be okay. I'll be better. What, what was it like raising a family during the height of your NASCAR career? What was that like? You know, to us, it was normal. I was raised in a, in a racing family and you know, racing was the, the head deal. Uh, when we got married and we had kids and stuff, then, you know, it was a, a good a good relationship. We was married 55 years, and uh, then we lost her. But uh, she lived the life, I lived the life, and then we lived the life together. And the same way with the kids, every chance we got, we took them. We went to California, or went to Florida, or went to Canada. We tried to take them as much as we could. And, uh, took them out of school, and then during the summer they travel all the time, so they had a lot of racing experience also. If we had a good day, then they'd all come to the winter circle, so they, they'd play around the infield and, you know, get dirty and <laughs> eat and have a big time, play football, whatever it was. And when the race was over, they'd go to the winter circle, so uh, that, that's how they grew up, and that was normal to them. And whether it was special visits to the White House or trips around the country, the four petty children Kyle, Sharon, Lisa, and Rebecca were taught not to boast about their ventures to their friends at school. One thing Linda instilled in all the kids was, you know, we go and we do things that the kids you go to school don't get the chance to do. So don't go bragging about it or don't go telling them because it makes them feel bad. You know what I mean? I mean, we went and enjoyed it, so you just keep it to yourself and go from there. So she did a good job with that. 
I think one of my favorite things in the museum is the characters made famous by Disney Pixar's The Cars movie, which you and Linda famously uh, voice uh, Mr. the King and Mrs. the King. But Linda wasn't originally supposed to be in that movie, was she? No, she really wasn't. Uh, they had, had me all fixed up to be the super bird and be Mr. the King. And uh, I went to California and I was in a little booth doing the voiceovers and all this kind of stuff. And uh, the man that was running the show, uh, John Lasseter, uh, he got to talking to Linda about what, how things used to be and how things were. And uh, he asked her, he said, would you like to be in a movie? Yeah, be all right with me. So he, she told him that uh, she wanted to be a uh, 69 Ford station wagon. Up to that time, we just had a regular four, four-door car and uh, she would fix food and have sandwich stuff in the back of the car and raise the trunk and the crew would come over and eat and I'd come and eat and the kids would all eat. And when she got that station wagon, she had all that room. She thought she died and gone to heaven. So that she wanted to be the be that car and that's the one they used for. It. What was it like hearing yourself on screen and, and Well, you know, they had it? a they had a big grand opening at uh, the show first show at Charlotte Motor Speedway. Had thirty thousand people in the stand and had a great big deal. And uh, when I came on, the grandkids didn't pay no attention, but when Grandma come on, they all jumped up and hollered because they heard, <laughs> heard her Grandma. So, but anyhow, we was able to find the original car that she wanted and they redone that. At the Petty Museum in Level Cross, you'll find many of the King's treasures, fast cars, and memories of his days of thunder. All of it part of the Petty family legacy. Each item unique in different ways. This is one of the very few museums in the world that's in an original place. Most time they take, a, take the houses or all the facilities that's been there, take it and put it in a big fancy building with chandeliers and, and all that. And they, I think it loses a little efficiency. Right here, when you come through that gate, you're back in time. This is 1949. This is where NASCAR started, uh, our part of the racing of it and uh, this is where we're still at. When you look in here, what is the most special thing you yeah, can think everything of? Everything in here is special. You know, I walk through here and I look and I say, how did one person have enough time just to touch every one of these things and then do something else too? You know what I mean? I know I mean, what you mean, yeah. So you say, how did you, how did you have time to collect this stuff or accumulate it or whatever it is? I mean, you know, we've got watches, we've got guns, you got, you know, belt buckles, and got trophies. I've also got like some special displays. We have um, the 10 championships that were won out of this, out of this compound. Um, we have those on display. We um, display some of our Hall of Famers, which we have four Hall of Famers from this camp, which is huge. Um, and then some special things to, to us as a family. So some of his personal collections, um, He's got his guns here, he's got his knives, as well as my mother's dolls. He's a very humble person, so you have to know that first. So when he walks through, he's like, we got a lot of stuff, don't we, you know? But, but he understands how us as, as children feel. It's like, we want to preserve everything we can because once again, it's our legacy, it's our heritage. I want my children to see what not only their grandfather did, but what my grandfather did. And, and I want my grandchildren to know where they came from and how much all of this means to, to us as a family. Next door to the museum is the historic Petty Home Place, where Richard and his younger brother Maurice were born. You know, my dad is, he came from a big family and he was very proud of his family. He's proud of, he's proud of where he came from right here in Randolph County. He's proud of North Carolina. You know, he always says, um, you know, I've, I've been a lot of places, but there's nowhere I like to go best than going back home because he, he loves it here. And so that house meant a lot to him because it's the house not only that he was born in, but it's the house that he grew up in. And you know, and, and my grandparents lived right there, right here on the same property, you know, building race cars in the backyard up until the day they passed away. And so, you know, the house just means a lot to all of us because there's so much history in it. And amid the family and racing history is living history including Richard Petty's very own chapter as an American hero, visits with presidents and awards of the highest honor. This is the one right here. Yeah. This is oh, the, yeah. 
And that's, that's when we see your eyes is when you go to the White House. Right. Yeah. <laughs> You've been to the White House quite a few times. What has that been like just to get to know some of that you history? You know, the first time we was invited up there, I think Nixon was president. And uh, so we get all get ready and get, get dressed up. And uh, I put my boots on. Linda said, you can't go to the White House on boots. I said, <laughs> i got to have shoes. <laughs> you know. So, you know, then first thing you know, you know, a couple of presidents got to wearing boots, so uh, I don't. I didn't set a trend. You started I think, a trend. I think the guys way back wore boots also. You received the Medal of Freedom. Right. Uh, what was that like from George Bush? That, of all the honors that's ever been bestowed on me, that was the greatest honor. Uh, there was not that many of them out there, and it's something that you don't work for. In other words, if you win a race and get a trophy, you work for that. A bunch of a bunch of people around you have made that happen. For the Petties, a fourth-generation racing legacy was not without heartache. On May 12, 2000, Richard's grandson Adam was killed in a crash during a practice run at the New Hampshire International Speedway. In Adam's memory, the Petty family helped to open the Victory Junction Gang Camp, a summer camp for children with special and medical needs located in Randleman in honor of Adam's desire to help others. After everything kind of settled a little bit, Family got together and Kyle and them said, you know, I'd like to do something in his memory. And uh, so they said, why don't we'll just, we'll just go ahead and go with build a camp. You know, we've been open, I guess, 11 years. Seen 22,000 kids that wouldn't get to go to camp. And when it comes to his fans, Richard Petty does not forget the people who have made his career. He is grateful and has been known to sign autographs for hours until the last fan leaves the racetrack. You're known for being good to your fans. You're known for um, signing autographs, especially for children. Why is this so important to you? Well, the deal being, we didn't have sponsors. didn't have names on the side of the car that paid millions of dollars to, to be involved. So we had to make our living out of the people in the grandstand. <clears throat> so right early, I said, if those guys hadn't bought a ticket, then the promoter couldn't have paid me for what I'd done. So it was like every time I wrote Richard Petty, it would say, thank you for buying a ticket and me being having enough money to feed the kids. So it, it just got to be an automatic deal. And then once you started doing it, you realized those were the people that was making it work. And so, again, it was just thank you and it's still a thank you. And for all his years of hurrying around the racetrack, his family describes him as laid back and a caring dad and grandfather, but still a little adventurous behind the wheel. The thing is, he's, he's, he'll be 78 in July, but don't tell him that because in his mind he thinks he's 59 or 60. He does not, he's, he's a kid at heart. He doesn't realize, he doesn't realize his age. Very laid back and kind of go with the flow and easy going, just not ever in a hurry. But when he gets behind the wheel of the car, he still likes to drive fast. So he, have to slow him down sometimes when he's in the car. He, he's a, he still thinks he has to go fast on the road. When I spoke with your youngest daughter, Rebecca, I asked her one of the, she told me that sometimes they have to keep you, make sure you're driving uh, the speed limit. Is that still, is that, <laughs> is it still fun to get behind that car? Well, and, and I'm probably not as bad as I used to be because, <laughs> you know, we'd run a race, we'd run Daytona, you run 200 mile an hour. And then we'd get in the car and drive home. You know, 65 mile an hour, I mean, I could get out and walk that fast. <laughs> you know? So they'd have to uh, woe me down every once in a while, but uh, it's not quite as bad now. I'm, I'm not as racy as I used to be. We work on the race cars in here, and now we work on street cars. But you'll still find him working okay. to produce high quality vehicles at Petty's Garage. A lot of time, put bigger engines in them, do bigger tires, wheels, brakes, suspension, mufflers, and all that stuff. Now these are street legal. Street uh, legal. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Street legal. This is Richard Petty's high performance speed shop, founded in 2008. Petty's garage is housed in the legendary Petty facility that for 60 years rolled out all those winning race cars. That one car there, it's a Dodge, it's a thousand horsepower. Oh, wow. That's a bunch. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. We're building. This is 40, beautiful. 43 of these. Okay. okay. Special paint jobs, special deals, special motor. If you if you look at it from an angle, see the sparkle in there. That's glass. Oh wow! Yeah. That's beautiful. 
And out in the sun, it really, really pops out at you. On the same floor where those history-making race cars took shape, there's a new Petty Crew, creating a new generation of Petty Automotives. And for some of the cars, complete with the famous Petty Blue. How did you get that Petty Blue? How did, how did, that, how did you guys well, come the, up with that? <laughs> blue come up, <laughs> we had a little bitty shot. And we got one night, we was get, getting ready to go to the race, we just built a new car, redone it or something, and uh, needed paint. And all we had was a little bit of white paint and a little bit of blue paint. So <laughs> instead of painting it too thin, we just poured it all in. When it got through, it said, man, it's a pretty color. So we remembered how much paint we had. We went to town and uh, told the guy what mixture, and then we finally got a deal on it. It's, it's a spatial number. It's called Petey Blue, and it's number for it and everything. So it Pat was just, it color. was an accident. Yeah. And yeah. we That's just sort great. of stuck with it because it was something a little bit different. This is, this is uh, the, the car in 1965, NASCAR, and, Chrysler didn't hit, didn't hit it off real good, and we couldn't run the Hemi engine, so they, we set out for about six months and went drag racing. <laughs> and found this car somewhere in Chicago or somewhere, I don't know. And the guy brought it in and wanted it fixed back up, so they just completely disassembled it. We assembled it just like it was when it was 1965. What kind of advice do you give in here? What kind of <laughs> Hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> no, it has to be right. I tell them, no matter how much time it takes, you know, you got a customer, he expects to be done right. And it, I try to tell them to do the pity way. Do it as good as you can do, and that's all we can ask. Everywhere you turn at the Lovell Cross Petty Compound has some item of significance and a story that Richard Petty tells so well, like this one about his first not so checkered flag. In 1959, my dad and myself were running a Lakewood Speedway, a mild dirt in Atlanta, and uh, when the race was over, they flagged me the winner. But when they got to checking the scorecard, then my dad won the race and I ran second. But this, when they tore the track down, the guys give us the... Oh, really? So that's, oh, wow. I got my first checker flag from there, even though I wasn't a winner. So that, that's what that was for. To one of the best known race drivers in the world. Memories of family and racing fill the walls of the museum a testament to the prestigious career of the one who is perhaps known as the greatest race car driver of all times, of the love of his family, and a life lived in the fast lane. Sharon, Sharon, and Lisa. Now is, that, is that Rebecca back there? No, yeah. the, is that Rebecca? Yes, okay, God, that's fun. So you had the whole crowd. Yeah, oh, that's great. Same way in here, you mean? So do you remember kind of what you were thinking in that moment? Kind of what was going on? Do you kind of remember each each yeah, individual? Yeah, when when you bring it back to me, and that was, what, what what do you remember in that scene? What do you remember here? Yeah. yeah. But just the what do you remember? It's, it's too too much stuff. Yeah. My computer don't kick in. I have some fan questions. If you could be anything else other than a race car driver, what would it have been? <laughs> I wish I was still a race car driver. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, I never thought about doing anything but this because, again, I grew up in this society and this was my life. And it might be different to other people, but it's normal to me. So anything I do besides what I do would be abnormal. And at my age, I'm not about to start new ventures, uh, not, not too far ahead anyway. Now, Nicole wants to know, what was your favorite meal and who was it prepared by? You know... I guess when you really get down to it, we, we travel everywhere, you gotta eat out all the time, and all that kind of stuff. But it was always neat to come home, uh, either with Linda or my mother, and eat a bowl of pinto beans, get you some fresh onions, some cornbread, and some good fresh milk. And that, I mean, it's not fancy, but that's sort of what you grew up with. And that, and that just brought us back to home. and. Uh, Probably still yet, that's probably his favorite meal as I have. What is the weirdest thing you've ever been asked to autograph? Uh, we was at the state fair one year uh, and uh, was doing an autograph session. And one of the maintenance guys come over and said, you know, I got something I want you to sign an autograph. I said, go get it. Come back, had a duck. <laughs> and he spread the wings out and I signed right across the What's the it duck like riding on a duck? 
wasn't that easy, but these magic markers do ever, do wonders. And so uh, I guess when the feathers come out, the autograph went away. But <laughs> What are you hopeful for, for the future of NASCAR? I hope it continues to grow. You know, we, we was really growing really leaps and bounds, and then uh, they had a recession, uh, and it's never really fully recovered from that. Of course, a lot of businesses haven't. I, racing's coming back. It's just, you know, I don't know if it'll ever be... Uh, the level you want it to be because you want it to be the number one deal. But uh, from a spectator standpoint, it's still, I guess, pretty close to being the number one sport in the United States. So uh, it's not a, not a bad place to be. Mr. The King, Richard Petty, thank you so much for joining us. Yes, ma'am. Thank you all for coming. North Carolina Now is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV. Funding for My Home NC is provided in part by the Tom Howe Fund for UNC-TV.